Hello, everyone, and welcome to this presentation for the ARRL Learning Network, an initiative of ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio. There are many ways radio amateurs can discover new ways to enjoy our pursuit of radio technology and communications. And this webinar series is our way to help connect experienced members with all members so we can share knowledge and experiences. And thank you all for being here today. I'm Chris Bickle, K1BIC. I'm the Lifelong Learning Manager at ARRL. I'm a member of the Learning Network team and today's webinar moderator. Today's presentation is Talking to Astronauts, an elementary school's exciting ARIS contact, and is being presented by Diane Warner, K-E-A-H-L-D. And we're also joined by Rosalie White, K1STO, ARRL's ARIS US delegate. The session will be recorded and this recording will be available within a couple hours after the session ends. And during the presentation, we encourage you to submit questions using the question box found along the right side. And we'll try to get to as many questions as possible during the Q&A period. Before we get started, we have a couple questions for you. I am going to show them up on the screen. Here's the first question. Have you ever watched or listened to an ARIS contact? So go ahead and select your answers. Okay, we're gonna close that out. And we'll share that up on the screen. So 41% of you have watched or listened, 59 have not, and not a single person asked what's ARIS. So that's a good, good group there. We have one more question for you. What is your interest in ARIS? And check all that apply. Go ahead and record your answers. All righty, we'll close that out. Put that up on the screen. So we have a few teachers, about 7%, and a few school administrators, 3%. Most of you are hams, 93%, and most of you have interest in space and satellites at 70%. So great. So that is it for me. And now I'm going to turn it over to Diane. All right. Well, I want to thank you, Chris, for inviting me to do this webinar. Um, just a little bit about myself. I work for After School Programs at Lancaster, and at the time of our contact, I was a site director at Talmadge Elementary. And it's really exciting to be able to combine my employment with my hobby, amateur radio. So in case you don't know what ARIS is, and it sounds like most of you do, um, ARIS lets students worldwide experience the excitement of talking directly with crew members on the International Space Station, inspiring them to pursue interest in careers in science, technology, engineering, and math, and engaging them with radio science technology through amateur radio. So what will you learn today? This is a story about the ARIS contact at my elementary school, Talmadge Elementary, on October 31st, 2018. You will learn about the effects that ARIS activities has on schools, teachers, students, amateur radio operators, and in your community, and how to submit an ARIS proposal, some tips and ideas. All right, the effect of ARIS activities on schools. Uh, the ARIS proposal asks educators to describe their year-long STEM curricular and hands-on activities for the students leading up to and after the radio contact with the ISS. So on my first day back to school, I watched as our staff decorated their hallways and classrooms with space-themed decorations. We had posters um, in the hallways that described the ham radio equipment that we would use and that is being used on the ISS. We had maps where Ohio astronauts were from, and we had some space-themed artwork. There was a, it was amazing, the excitement that was going in our school building before school started as our staff came back in and, and they were so excited to um, experience this year with the students. Our after school students made posters of each of the 25 Ohio astronauts. Um, and yes, there are Ohio, 25 astronauts in Ohio. It took a long, a long time to make these. The students um, would be, get excited because the teachers, when they were in the hallways, they would read each day a different astronaut to their, their class while they're standing in the hallways. This inspired not just students, but it inspired the teachers as well, as they learned about the commitment and sacrifice of these brave explorers and their careers in science. One of our third grade teachers designed a special t-shirt and every student and staff received one on the first day of school. And after a rather inspiring talk from our principal, he explained what was gonna happen at school this year and we had a big school picture taken. 
and one of my coworkers in our after school program and I, we dressed up in uh, orange flight suits just for the fun of it. And our students were very excited. Um, they wore their t-shirts that day and they also wore them on the day of our school contact. The Lancaster and Fairfield County Amateur Radio Club and after school programs in Lancaster entered a float on the 4th of July parade. We had a large banner and you can see it on there in the middle was made to explain what was going to happen to our community in the fall. The city's Christmas parade actually came after our contact. And the grand marshal for the parade was Allison Bollinger. She's a NASA flight director and she graduated from our local high school. So the city provided a special float. They had, um, you can kind of see it in the picture there. They provided a rocket from a local amusement park. And some of the students who talked to the astronaut were asked us to ride on the float behind Allison. And the other students we had rode on our radio club's float. And the students, they were just beyond excited to be part of this parade. And they saw Allison as a role model with her NASA career. And on a side note, our Aries team, we run comm for both of those parades. We ran our net control from the back of the float. So <laughs> it was a lot of fun. We really enjoyed that. We um, also enlisted the help of students from our high school our Lancaster High School Criminal Science and Forensic Program students, they greeted the guest as they entered the school for the contact. When they first arrived at the school, their first question they asked was, can we watch the contact? And they really understood what an amazing opportunity it was for them just to be there and be able to participate. Um, after our contact, our guests were um, asked to attend a special luncheon that was prepared by the Lancaster High School Culinary Arts students. And you could really feel the excitement from the guests. This, we had city officials, state representatives, schools, board members, city council members, and others. And they would talk about how exciting it was to be part of this contact and the wonderful activities our students would be learning. And we had put up trifolds around the room explaining all the things that our students either had learned or were getting ready to learn, um, all of our STEM activities and some of the samples there. So the effect of ARIS activities on teachers. Teachers got really excited by seeing what ways that they could incorporate space with their students and in the classroom. The students were more inquisitive about space. And for myself, I really enjoyed trying to find some STEM activities for my students and watching their interest and curiosity. It, for me, it was very rewarding. Um, the excitement my students had learning about STEM led me to being able to teach them in all five of our after-school programs instead of just my school at Talmadge. And the teachers, they were really pleased the students were excited for the contact, and this made teaching STEM more exciting for them, for the teachers and the students. And I've got a, a short video here that's an interview that was done by our school system right the, on the first day of school. The whole spacing, it's really cool because we have, uh, every teacher tried to get these uh, like space posters. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not in science or even math for that matter, uh, we're, we're trying to incorporate it in everything and kind of make it visual and talk about it with the kids. So we have the astronauts posters all up in the hallways for Ohio. We have maps, we have information on the walls, and then we're kind of doing an ongoing theme everywhere. I mean, getting ready uh, at the beginning of the school year is crazy anyways. Um, but it, it adds a little fun and excitement and expectation is a great word for that uh, to uh, for the kids. It's really exciting. It's nice to have kind of a unifying theme between all the different grade levels and all the different teachers because we have kids ranging from kids who have never come to school before to our fifth graders who have all kinds of experience. And, and so it's kind of something that's brought the building together even in our different halls and pods. It's so big, it's so unknown, um, and, it, and it's so cool. It's, it's one of those things that's easy to talk about, um, uh, easy to get excited about. You are one of 13 buildings in the United States that's going to be able to speak with the International Space Station. They're pretty excited. I haven't tried to overload too much since we do have that in our science unit this year. 
that we're going to kind of do in winter. But we have a lot of really exciting activities, and a lot of it is cross-curricular, which is the great thing. We can mix so much of it with the math and with the um, social studies and with the reading standards. So it's something that, even though it's science-y, can really branch out. Even we, we took that picture today and walking back in, loads of questions from my fifth graders. What's the space station? What do they do there? Uh, Will we be able to see it from Earth? So all of these awesome questions that um, are, we're having these little mini lessons in the hallways. So it was, it was really cool. All right. Well, our teachers are very excited. And even to this day, when I walk in the school building, which I don't get into much, they, they still talk about it. So, OK, um, the effect of Eris activities on students. Our school held several space camps during the school year. The students uh, watched a tour of the ISS by Sunita Williams. This answered many of the students' questions, and it gave them better understanding of life on the ISS. They also sampled freeze-dried ice cream and compared it to real ice cream sandwiches. And it was really fun watching their faces because most of them did not like the freeze-dried ice cream. And they made um, rockets with torn pieces of paper. It was a mess. We had paper all over the gym. The students had a great time. They were very excited. And when we were all done with it, the principal, who's um, kind of a fun guy, got down on the floor there and he says, take my picture because we survived math camp, or I'm sorry, we survived space camp. So he was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, we also had Allison Bollinger, the NASA flight, flight director, came back. She brought various items that astronauts either wear or use on the ISS. Our students were very inquisitive. They enjoyed being able to see up close and hold the items, and they asked some really good questions. They, oops, there, there's, there's Allison there, and that's some of the pictures of things that she brought um, for the kids to actually pick up and to look at. We had a student who participated in the contact. He was so excited about being able to talk on amateur radio to the ISS that his dad and he began studying for their license. Both of them joined the Radio Club's builders group and they made the tape measure Yagis. The same student and his teacher went before the school board meeting and they shared about the contact, how it inspired him to learn more about STEM. He also showed his tape measure Yagi, explained how it works and his sister saved her money so she could buy an American Girl doll uh, astronaut flight suit. So after school program students began their STEM activities about a year before our contact and during the school year of the contact as well. And some of our favorite activities were students assembled an Arduino Allegro smart robotic car. Um, this was something they learned about when we had some uh, ham radio youth come in and teach them about uh, robots and, and line following. Um, our students also learned about Morse code. They practiced their name on a Morse code practice oscillator. And during one of our after school family nights, they were very excited to show their parents how to send their name in Morse code. Using the NASA program Train Like an Astronaut, our students utilize the same body parts and systems as astronauts do in training and on missions in space. After completing the training activities, the students were surprised with a NASA jawstring backpack. The Ohio State University rocket team came and they brought their rockets and they had some really big rockets. It was very cool. Um, after they talked about what they do, they had the students make their own Alka-Seltzer rockets and they launched them with the OSU students. And it was a blast, pun intended. Um, it was a mess, we had to be inside, it was raining, but they had a great time shooting those rockets up. Center of Science and Industry, we say COSI, brought their hands-on robotic science program for the students to learn how to program a robot. And our after-school program held a parent night for our families to make scribble bots. A couple of our radio club members, and you can see them in the picture, uh, they came and they helped some of the students whose parents weren't able to attend. One of our students was so excited, he took a scribble bot to school the next day to show his teacher, and he carried it around school all day, she had told me. Our students were so excited to learn, and especially the hands-on activities. 
some of them have never used a tool before. It was the first time and, and they thought that was pretty cool. So observing an, an heiress contact can be very, very captivating. Our contact had, after our contact, many people told me how amazed they were that over 600 students were so quiet and so engaged in the contact, you could hear a pin drop. And to celebrate such an amazing day, our students watch movies about space in the portable inflatable planetarium dome. And it was a fun way for the students to see space exploration after watching the Eris contact. So the effect of Eris activities on local amateur radio operators. Well, just before the contact, Scott, who was the Ohio section manager, now he's the ARRL Great Lakes vice director, he tells this story in the Ohio section newsletter. So I'm going to quote him. Before the contact was made, I got to see all the equipment up close and personal. And as I stepped down from the stage, I had a very little one grab my pant leg. I bent down to hear what this little one had to say, and it grabbed me to the core. He said, Mister, I get to talk to an astronaut today. The look in this kid's eyes was absolutely amazing. You would have thought it was Christmas, as his eyes were as big as saucers. He and all the kids were so excited to do this very special thing. And that is Scott's story, and it was a special day. I work with some students that have a variety of challenges in their lives. So I invited some young amateur radio operators to come and talk to my students about ham radio. They had my students' attention for over an hour, and which for my students is quite amazing. But these young hams, they were just as excited as the students were to come and to share in their knowledge. And they were fortunate they were able to be there for the contact as well. As a result of the AERIS contact, the relationship between our city and amateur radio club and our ARIES team was strengthened. It opened doors that allowed us to install, install more equipment on our city property and towers. It created an atmosphere of knowledge and trust in our community. For example, our ARIES team was working at a local festival and a sheriff deputy came up. He gave us a thumbs up. He says, great job with the school and the ISS. We didn't know who he was but we did feel very encouraged um, by him and by our community for the role that we had in that contact. For our individual amateur radio operators, this was a high point in our amateur radio endeavors. We still get excited whenever we're given a chance to talk about ARIS. I enjoyed the opportunity to speak at a very large audience, close to 200 I was told, at the ARIS forum at the Hamvention in 2019. And friendships were formed between our team and the ARIS volunteers. In fact, I, I really miss Hamvention because that's my chance to go each year and to spend time with my ARIS friends. Um, in the picture in the, in the middle is Rosalie, who's the secretary for ARIS USA. And on the far right, there's a picture in the middle. It has Gordon, who's our technical mentor for ARIS. And I'm very happy and pleased that, that I've continued a friendship with them. So the effect of ARIS activities in our community. The community supported our radio club and the after-school programs of Lancaster with grants from the Fairfield County Foundation to purchase radio equipment and educational materials. Having media coverage is also very vital to an ARIS contact. And we had over 10,000 views of our ARIS contact video on Facebook. Community's comments were very encouraging. They were proud of our students and what they had accomplished. At our lunch reception after the contact, when the amateur radio operators walked into the room, all of the guests stood up and applauded the team. They shared with us our excitement in making the contact with the ISS. They recognized the hard work and commitment of our team to give these students a life-changing experience. And I have to say, there's no greater feeling than spending a year working on this project to hear that, that voice come, come across, and it's the astronaut in the ISS. Our guests include our city's mayor, state representatives, the county EMA, the school board, after school programs of Lancaster, board of directors, and many others. In fact, our mayor was so excited about ARIS that he expressed his excitement on Facebook right after the contact, and he was the first person ever to post on it. It, it was pretty amazing. Whoops, I forgot to turn the slide. That's a picture of our, our um, 
lunch and afterwards. Okay, so how to submit an ARIS proposal, tips and ideas. So before you decide that you want to submit a proposal, you might want to consider the following. Do you have the commitment and support of your organization, community, and local amateur radio club? It takes a team to create and implement a good education plan in ARIS contact. And are you willing to take the time it takes to plan and execute your education plan? So if you answer yes, then you want to get started. Um, the ARIS.org gives you a lot of good information um, on submitting the process. If you go to, and I put a website up there, this is the download for the proposal guide. Um, this is a great resource. I used it a lot. It's got a lot of really, really good information in there. You can sign up for the webinar that's held twice a year, or there's another link where you can view a pre-recorded webinar. Um, I looked on the website this morning, and if you go to the ARIS.org website, they are holding another webinar on February 25th at, let's see, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Should have done that earlier, I'm sorry. If you go up there, you can see a copy of it on YouTube. Um, so when you're ready, download the proposal form. You can submit a proposal two times a year, usually November and April. The fall proposals are scheduled for contacts from July 1st through December 31st, and the spring proposals are scheduled for contacts from January 1st through June 30th. All right, here are some, some tips. The ARIS Proposal Review Committee will approve proposals that best meet the program's objectives. Because there are a limited number of contact opportunities, the committee must be selective. So consider the goals of ARIS when writing your proposal. Inspire an interest in science, technology, engineering, and math, the STEM subjects, and in STEM careers among young people. And to provide an educational opportunity for students, teachers, and the general public to learn about space exploration, space technology, and amateur radio as the pre preparation for the event. To be successful, you want to make an impact on your students, so you need a strong education plan. And you want to be creative. And you want to make sure that when you submit your proposal, that you answer all the questions on the proposal. And make sure that your answer is answering the questions. So if the answer or the question is about the media plan, make sure you write about the media plan. And for some ideas, there's some um, websites that you can go to. ARRL Education and Technology Program and NASA offer valuable resources to help you and your students learn about wireless technology and satellite communications and space exploration. Let's see. NASA homepage. Um, this site is a gateway to all NASA education programs and services for educators and students. You can search for resources by subject, grade level, topic, and type. There are educator guides posters and multimedia with information on space that you'll find useful in planning student activities. I use this site a lot. It was, it's really good. Uh, the SCAN page. This site serves as a main homepage for SCAN, the NASA organization responsible for NASA's communications with satellites, including the ISS. And ISS National Laboratory is a great re resource for videos and lessons. And I just want to thank, like, after School Programs of Lancaster for supporting me. When I told my director, Michelle, I wanted to do this, um, she was all on board for Lancaster and Fairfield County, County Amateur Radio Clubs for humoring a new ham by saying, sure, we'll do this. And of course, Lancaster City Schools for their support as well. And to ARIS for their sponsors, ARRL, AMSAT, NASA SCAN, and ISS National Lab. And that's all I've got, so I'll send it back to Chris. All right, thanks so much, Diane. Nothing more exciting than speaking to an astronaut, and I'm sure it was not an easy venture for you, but definitely worthwhile, and thanks for sharing. So Thank you. with all the STEM resources out there, what, what prompted you to reach out to ARIS to begin with? Well, I was at the a brand new ham, actually. I was in our clubhouse one day, and a couple of the uh, amateur radio operators were talking about ARIS, and I thought, well, I, I work in an elementary school. Let's let's do this at my school. So that's how I started. I went on with ARIS and learned about the proposal and, and how to do it. 
do you as the teacher need to be a licensed amateur radio operator to initiate an ARIS contact? No, you do not. I was just fortunate that I am an operator, but no, you do not. And where did you find the local club to help you out with the contact? I was at the time already a member of the club, so I, I did not have to worry about finding a local club. Um, there are resources out there to find clubs. Um, I know even on the AIRS webpage, they'll, they'll have a link where you can uh, get help in finding local amateur radio clubs if you are a teacher and you're looking for help. Great. And just to let everyone know, ARRL does offer a loaner station, which is the backup station for any school that's making a contact. We have the entire kit in a box here at headquarters. And if it's a contact close to us in Connecticut, we can actually bring it out, which we did once for Ashford, Connecticut's contact. And then also we can ship it anywhere across the country for anybody who might need it. Information about that is also on our website. And what was your biggest challenge, Diane, in putting this all together and getting it, getting the contact to be so successful? Wow, biggest challenge. Um, I, I don't know if there is one biggest challenge. Um, I think, you know, once we purchased the equipment as a ham radio operator for me um, and for our team was to, once we purchased the equipment, was setting it up um, and, and learning the equipment so that when we um, got to the school, it was all ready to go. Uh, some of the things we did is we ran all of our cabling uh, this just before school started. So everything was in place and, and would go much more smoother. Uh, the education plan went pretty well. Um, you had to adjust sometimes with school schedules and things that would come up. So you had to be flexible, but it, it was fine. How many teachers did it take to be involved and set up the whole contact? I know the whole school was involved in the event, but how many of you worked behind the scenes to get all this going? Oh, boy. Um, since I'm in after school programs, it was pretty much my team that that did all that. So I'd say there's uh, about two or three of us that that worked on getting um, all the behind the scenes done with with bringing in the high school students and uh, getting the education plan and the grants written and, and all that. Um, as far as the radio club, uh, there's probably about I want to say 10 to 12 of us that worked on it, and there's about three of us that worked on it a lot. So I, I, there were many light, long, long days and long nights for us, but uh, it was worth it. Oh, I'm sure. And just a reminder that on the ARRL website, there's also a club finder that you can use to find clubs in your area. So it's a, it's easy to find help and the clubs are usually super excited to help because it's exciting for them too. And how long did it take you to, not the proposal part, but the, the planning and the formation of the contact and the, the educational lessons around it? How long did that take? To, to plan those items? Yeah, to kind of put the, the your own plan together to get the kids excited. Oh boy, I think um, I, I was um, probably a little slow in mind. Uh, when I, by the time I found out about it and the proposal window I had, I think I had everything done in three weeks, put together. And then of course implement it took me a year. Great. And how have you incorporated what you've learned or, and, and what you experienced during the contact into any type of curriculum or extracurricular activities for the students? Has there been any follow-up, any continuation of, of the lessons that you used? Actually, yes. Um, after that year, we decided that um, because our we have programs in all five of our elementaries, we took that the next step and we had, I went and started teaching Tim, at, I'm sorry, I took, taught the STEM project, uh, subjects in all of our schools. Um, this year, I'm actually writing STEM for next year due to COVID, you know, things 
we're different. We couldn't do it this year, but next year we're going to be um, having STEM clubs in all five of our after-school programs. So it definitely has continued that that train of thought. And we have another question. We're in the process of setting up a program from the ground floor up. Do you have any tips for us just at the very early stages about how to conceptualize and make this all happen? You know, I would say if you go on to that proposal guide, um, that gave me some wonderful, wonderful ideas on setting this up. I think talking to other people who may have um, had a proposal helps, who's made a contact. Um, I think just getting your equipment and learning how to use it so you feel more confident when it's time. Great. What I'd like to do now is ask Rosalie White to come on and give us some of her thoughts about this contact and also give us any updates on ARIS and the ISS that she may have for us. Rosalie, are you available right now? Okay, uh, now I'm unmuted and uh, okay, I don't know about, there it goes. Okay, um, again, just what Diane said, um, a lot of people say, you know, I, I don't know what to do. Well, that ARIS proposal guide that she told you about downloading takes you step by step. And if you follow all the instructions in there, you'll know exactly what to do. And at the end are all kinds of um, resources for if you say, you know, I don't know what hands on STEM things I can do. It is chock full of all kinds of ideas for that. And then, of course, the teachers are always really good at saying, well, I don't quite want to do that, but I could do this with my kids. And teachers are so creative, they can make it fit their own program. Um, the one thing that I found so exciting in watching so many of these, which they never get old. The hair always stands up on the back of my neck and <laughs> when the voice comes through and the kids are so excited is that the kids are changed afterwards and it's kind of hard to explain how, but um, I've seen kids who were very nervous and very shy and they get up there and they do a good job for their school and they realize that they can do something that they weren't sure they could do and they did it well and they just have um, pride, good pride, and they have that oomph, their spines are straighter, um, they are just more confident about them, themselves and it's just a wonderful thing to see that um, they have an interest in a new area. Oftentimes right afterwards you say, what, what do you want to do when you grow up? And they say, um, I want to help astronauts go into space, or I want to be an astronaut, or I want to be the president. Um, it's just fun to see how this experience and learning, they've grown so much. And Rosalie, another question for you. If a school made a contact years ago, can they do it again? Is there a waiting period or is there any kind of limitation? Of course, we want them and NASA wants them to have a, a whole new group of students. So oftentimes it could be like three years and you're pretty certain that you're touching all new students. Um, sometimes a school will want to mentor another school in the area, maybe a school that didn't have quite as many privileges as their school. Um, and again, you wouldn't want to apply like a year or two years later, I should say, send in your proposal because it's not really an application process, it's a proposal process. So, you know, three years is a good rule of thumb. Uh, competition is pretty stiff. So, um, you know, if there's, certain amount of slots and there's way way too many really good proposals then um, we always want to take the very best proposals but if yours is equivalent to the person's 
uh, right above you and you've had a contact before, the, of course, the one that's just above you is going to get picked. Hope that answers the question. Very good, thanks. And oh, and by the way, um, the, the, the selection process is handled by the ARIS U.S. Education Committee, and that's a group of educators from around the country. Great, thanks. Do you have any updates for us, Rosalie, about the International Space Station and what's going on with that right now? Sure. Um, probably a lot of you heard that the new station that's in the Columbus module um, is not on the air right now. It was um, had a cable a swap out on the exterior of the Columbus module um, in February, and the that was for um, there's a platform that was installed on the Columbus module to hold exterior payloads. And when the spacewalk was completed to attach that platform, um, it, the, it required a change out of a cable. And the cable is slightly different from the one that was there before. And when they reinstalled it and then turned the radio on, there was no um, signal. So, um, Right now, the ARIS contacts are being hosted in the Russian service module. Um, our teammates, our uh, Russian teammate, of course, it's a worldwide team, and we have teammates all over the world, but our Russian teammates are very generous in allowing the astronauts to come in and take up room in the service module and um, operate the station while they're maybe doing some other research. And so the, nothing can, can stop ARIS. So that's the good part. And uh, of course, ESA and NASA, uh, the spacewalk was for an ESA project. ESA stands for European Space Agency. ESA and NASA and ARIS are all working together to um, pinpoint what the problem could be. There's a handful of things that are um, suspects. And um, there's some simple testing that has already been done, but you can imagine there's a lot of complexity to different tests that could be done, and those are ongoing. So um, just ask people to stand by, and um, we'll have our APRS and packet and SSTV and um, crossband repeater back, we hope, um, before too long. Um, when the testing is going on, of course, we want everything to be quiet so we can um, perform those tests and ask that people not email and say, hey, it's still not working. <laughs> so um, you will know as soon as we know, that's for sure. Does that uh, answer the question enough, Chris? Yeah, that was great. Thank you for the update. And one final question before we wrap up. How long has ARIS been around for making contacts? And do you know of any, and if it's been around long enough, do you know of any astronauts who ever became astronauts because they had an ARIS contact? Okay, well, um, in 1996, of course, the shuttles were still flying and we had amateur radio on those. And NASA approached us and they said, if you wanna have ham radio on the space station, you have to come up with one worldwide team. We're not going to talk to hams in all the different countries that support the space station. So you come up with a world team. And I think they didn't think we could do it, but we did. And they hosted the meeting in November 1996 to set up a working group. And there was a ham radio operator who traveled from their country, um, from every region that does sponsor the ISS, and that was the start of it. Um, of course, the space station opened for habitation in late 2000, and within two weeks, the astronauts were so excited to try out uh, ARIS. It was the very first payload to be operated on the ISS, and um, first contact was, like I said, two weeks later with the team to make sure that um, everything was functioning correctly, uh, an orbit over Russia, an orbit over the US, each one was fine. And within um, 
I think it was two more weeks or three more weeks, the first school contact took place. And yes, um, our teammate at Johnson Space Center talks to every astronaut class. And as they learn more about the space station, um, before they become full astronauts, he speaks to them again and, and tells them a little bit about ERAs. And that's when they decide if they're interested and as they go along in their training, um, they decide that how they want to study. He helps them decide what the best way is to study, whether it's self-study or with a class. And then he helps them find a testing site. And um, it very rarely is a person a ham before they become an astronaut. It, it happens, but not too much lately. Um, so we are very fortunate that so many of them think it's a great thing. Um, there is a video clip of a um, one of the gals, Sunita Williams, who got her license. And when she was asked during a huge conference of space corporations, um, what did you enjoy the most about some of the things you did on space station? And she said, Eris. And she explained what it was, and she said, you know, you think you're just going to be talking for 10 minutes during the pass to a classroom. And after you talk to them, you realize that there were a thousand kids there in the whole auditorium watching. And she said, it, it just, it's incredible. So, yes, yes, and yes, Chris. That's great. Thanks so much, Rosalie. And thanks for joining us today. We appreciate your time and we appreciate you being a champion for ARIS and for all it does for students and teachers. So thanks again, Rosalie. Diane, before we wrap up, any final thoughts, any final tips? Well, I, I just say um, if you're an amateur radio operator and you have the opportunity to work with the school, you should do it. It is just an amazing, amazing experience and one that we're still excited about. So. It's a good thing to do. Great. Thank you so much, Diane, for sharing your story today. It was a great story. Glad everything went well. And thanks again for your time. And for, for everybody, it's a reminder to visit the Learning Network page for a schedule of our upcoming webinars and past recordings. Go to awrl.org, click on the webinar link under the slider, or do a search for the Learning Network. And our next session is titled, Technicians, Life Beyond Repeaters, and is being presented by Anthony Luskry, K8ZT, on Tuesday, March 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And we're always looking for more presenters, and there's a call for presenters on the page as well. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us, and have a great day. Thanks.